and that goes back to your question about neurobiology. You know, I see it sort of in real time every day um, that we can change our brains. I mean, it's that, it's that simple, that we can change our brains. And that's what's so amazing. Hi, this is Liz Weaver, and you are listening to the Learning Success Podcast, an information-packed podcast with the latest news, information, and tips to help you overcome a learning difficulty. For anyone suffering from a reading difficulty, writing difficulty, a math difficulty, a focus problem, dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, or ADHD, this is the place for you. The Learning Success Podcast is brought to you by LearningSuccessSystem.com. Hello, and welcome to the Learning Success Podcast, where we learn to embrace your child's brilliance and unleash their true potential. I'm Phil Weaver, and I'll be your host today. Today, we have Erica Curtis. Erica is a board-certified art therapist and licensed marriage and family therapist with a private practice in San Juan Capistrano. She is on the teaching faculty at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles and is an instructor for UCL Arts and Healing. She has contributed to media outlets such as PBS, Lifehacker, Cosmo, L, USA Today, US News and World Report, Women's World Magazine, Boston Globe, She Knows Parenting, UCLA's Healthy Years, eHealth Family, and more. And she is the author of The Innovative Parent, Raising Connected, Happy, Successful Kids Through Art. Welcome, Erica, and thank you for coming today. Yeah, hi, Phil. Thanks for having me. Great. So um, let's get in. You have a private practice and a, a unique approach to helping um, parents help their kids who are struggling. Can you start off by telling us about that? Of course, yeah. So, you know, this isn't going to be any surprise to uh, your listeners, but, uh, you know, talking to kids doesn't always work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's so many um, books out there and strategies out there on talking to kids and best practices and talking to kids and, and listening to kids. And even when we can use those, right, when we're sort of in our best parenting selves and we can really access some of those, those talk-based strategies, um, at least I know I have found not only in my clinical practice but with my own children, um, that even those best practices um, in talking to kids often fall flat. Um, I can I can think of plenty of times with my own children where, you know, I'm helping them to understand their feelings and I'm acknowledging their frustration or if I've made a mistake and, you know, the response I get is, I hate you, go away. <laughs> um, I can't hear you, leave me alone. Um, so so what I have begun to do is, is take all of my years of, professional experience as an art therapist and start to really look at how we can distill the best, best practices in art therapy for parents to access creative avenues at home in order to connect and communicate with their kids, especially when their kids are really struggling. Okay, good. Can you tell us a little bit what, what exactly is art, art therapy? Right, sure. So art therapy is a master's level profession. And what we do is we combine um, psychological practices, mental health practices, uh, with knowledge about the mental health and social benefits of the arts. And so we use um, in my particular profession, a visual art therapy, right, there's also music therapists and movement therapists and you know, mm -hmm. creative arts therapist, but I specifically specialized in the use of visual therapy, visual arts, um, in order to help kids to do things like um, get some distance from their emotion by drawing it, right? We call it externalizing, um, to be able to um, express themselves through um, using arts material in order to move um, energy um, out, you know, that might be stemming from anger or frustration, but being able to do it in a more pro-social way. Um, and then they have an object that they can look at and that they can observe, and then they can start to talk about. Um, and so the art therapies use a whole lot of different types of interventions um, in order to help people to access parts of their experience that they might not be able to with words um, for various reasons. Um, sometimes simply because we don't have the words to really describe what's going on with us. And so it's another way of helping people to communicate um, and to understand themselves better. I see. Okay, so um, let's talk about uh, emotions then. So say kids understanding their 
their emotions. How, what, right. would that, what would that look like through art therapy? Right. So, you know, yeah, of course. So, you know, if, if we think about it, when we're under stress, and this is adults as well as children, when we're under stress or, or having heightened emotions about something, you know, the thinking part of our brain goes, you know, goes yes. not completely offline, but it decreases. Our ability to think decreases. Our ability to access and process language decreases. Our ability to regulate our emotions. So the emotional regulation center of the brain decreases, right? Mm -hmm. And so we get a whole lot of just activation, a lot of fight flight and freeze responses that go on. And that can look like, you know, anything from going into the room and slamming the door um, to an outburst, for example, or a tantrum, um, or just kind of, you know, spacing out, uh, right, which would be more of a freeze response. Uh -huh. And so what we can start to do using visual strategies is helping kids to be able to connect with what they're actually feeling. So for example, you know, I use a lot of emojis, sort of what I call like souped up emojis um, in not only my work with my clients, but also at home with my own kids. We're all, you know, even just show them some pictures and say, you know, I'm wondering which one is here right now. You know, which is the one that says I hate homework. Okay. Right? Which one is saying, I don't want to go to school, right? Um, and then they can pick the, the feeling face and they don't really have to understand it and they don't have to label the emotion, right? Because if we uh -huh. say to kids like, oh, well, how are you feeling when you don't want to go to school? They're not going to be able to do that and nor are they going to want to, right? They just want you to leave them alone. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> at that point. And so instead we can give them an image to work with or we can draw a picture and say, you know, hey, I wonder what's going on, for example, and then give them the opportunity to respond with a drawing. So what we're doing is we're accessing the emotional part of the brain through the sensory experience of of the visual image, right? Because the sensory mm -hmm. part of the brain stays online. Even when the language part decreases and the thinking part decreases, the sensory part of the brain that can take in rhythm and music and visual stimuli stays online. So we okay. can kind of get in there through the back door that way um, by giving them these other opportunities. And then they have a picture, for example, the emoji or the drawing to look at. And then we can say, I wonder what this character is saying. Well, it's saying, I don't want to go to school. Okay, I wonder what it's thinking. And we can add a thought bubble, for example. And then maybe that thought is going to give us some more information. I'm scared, mm -hmm. for example. So, so is that, you keep referencing to those like, as which one and, and that. So is that externalizing? Is that? Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that we're doing is externalizing. So anytime that we can take an emotion and manifest it outside of the person, Mm -hmm. using a visual, we're externalizing that, that feeling. And so now it's concrete. Now it's something, especially for children, right? Children really need things to be quite concrete. That's just where their brain development is at. So they can understand it, they can hold it, they can manipulate it. Feelings are very, you know, ephemeral. They're, they, you can't really describe them, you can't pin them down. But if you can manifest it physically as a drawing or as a object, Right. Now we can look at it, we can name it, we can talk to it, we can develop a dialogue, we can have a friendly relationship with that feeling. Right. And now we can start to relate differently to that feeling. And now what also happens in that externalizing process is the child gets a little distance from their feeling. So they are not their feeling. Yeah. Right. They mm -hmm. are a child and a feeling is coming to visit them and the feeling has something to say. I see, interesting. How would that, I know you especially is, especially is in visual, but I'm curious, how would somebody in like music therapy or the movement therapy, what, what would be the, the parallel in those, do you know? Right, so my, my co-author, Ping Ho, who is the director and founder of UCLA Arts and Healing, um, she is actually a, a drummer. And so she brings that component to the book and also to the work that, that we do at UCLA Arts and Healing. Um, that she brings rhythm and music and movement um, in a therapeutic way okay. to, um, she does a lot of work with kids in schools, for example, and bringing a therapeutic drumming curriculum to children in the schools. And so what she talks about are things like um, 
you know, drumming out the the feelings, for example, if it's frustration, what does frustration sound like okay. you know, through drumming or through shaking, you know, shaking shakers, for example, and how loud is it and how quiet is it and how loud is it and how quiet is it? And what you're also doing then is you're moving that angry energy, which is fight flight energy, really, you're yep. moving it out of the body and discharging it in a way that's healthier than, for example, slamming doors or hitting or throwing pencils or, or whatever else a child might do. So you're also giving them that physical outlet. Okay, okay, then that makes it pretty obvious how someone in movement theory would would do the same thing by how would you move or how would that feeling move that sort of thing. right, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, it, very it, interesting. Um, so you've talked about um, art therapy helping kids connect with others. How, how does that happen? Well, so art can help kids connect with others. Um, and also we've been talking about how it connects, helps them to connect with themselves, right? So we start so, there, right? Yeah. Right. So that's that connection piece, right? Is first, how do I connect really my thinking brain back up with my emotional brain, right? If that thinking brain has gone offline, how do we get it back online? And the first thing we need to do is sort of calm the nervous system, right? That we can uh -huh. do these different activities, um, such as drumming, you know, could kind of relax the nervous system, for example, or being able to externalize an emotion, have a dialogue, right? And so now what happens as we're reflecting on the art, all that's starting to come back online. The language is starting to come back online. The thinking part of the brain is starting to come back online. And now we can connect with ourselves again, okay. right? The child can connect with themselves and what they're experiencing. And that, of course, allows them to connect with other people. So even as an adult, for example, to help a child, um, you know, when we're offering them other opportunities other than speaking to them, you know, why did you do that? What's wrong? How are you feeling about, you know, when we talk, 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 talk. And they're disconnected not only from themselves, but from us as well, oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And so just the simple act of offering the opportunity to make something together reconnects the child to us and helps to start to regulate them, right? Because we're, we're also regulating them through regulating ourselves and, and so forth. Yeah. Now there's a whole nother piece also, I don't know if you'd like to talk a little bit about like social, you know, social components in terms of how kids can connect with other kids if they're social, right? So there's all these different layers to how the arts can help people to connect, not only helping kids connect with themselves, but helping them to connect with the adult who's trying to get through to them. But also there's a lot of kids who struggle socially um, and some kids who even have social right impairments um, mm -hmm. in certain areas, um, all the way to just kids just learning how to, you know, be people amongst other people when everyone's, you know, just trying to kind of figure it out and how do we connect with each other. Um, so then there's that too and how art can come into the mix in, in that realm. So so how would that work? Somebody with a social impairment or uh, right. connecting so, with others? Yeah. And so one example of that would be, um, you know, I, I, I like to start with parallel play. You know, we, we look at where where's the ability level and, and we want to scaffold up to it. And okay. so if if they're really having a hard time and that can be because of a you know impairment in social skills or social development or it could be for example um, because of trauma um, or anxiety or you know something else that's getting in the way of them being able to feel comfortable interacting with others and so mm -hmm. we want to start with some really basic developmental skills such as parallel play right and that parallel play is something that we've all see our, seen our little ones do you know usually when they're toddlers and they're in the sandbox and they're not really playing with anybody else but they're next to somebody and they're maybe you know sharing toys maybe not maybe snatching toys <laughs> you know uh -huh. but they're very aware of the other child they're very aware of what's going on and that's something that parents don't always understand that that this is a really important developmental stage for children to go through this parallel play we're not really playing with but we're not playing separate we're kind of playing next to each other and i'm being influenced by what you're doing and you're being influenced by what i'm doing and maybe we can even start to move up to sharing things and asking for things so that's a really basic developmental level so how that would look in art for example, because they're doing a task, right? They can sit next to each other or across from each other, but do a similar task. Hey, we're going to bead. We're going to 
do this drawing or a craft. We're going to make holiday cards or whatever it might be. But we're all sitting down doing the same activity. And maybe we're even having to do something like sharing the scissors and asking for you to pass me the scissors or asking to pass the glue um, without snatching it, without falling apart, right? So there's lots of skills built into this moment um, where children can start to learn how to be with others. Now, if we go all the way up to more advanced skills in terms of how art can come into play, um, you know, we can start looking at things like um, collaborating on a project together, mm -hmm. right? Um, having a challenge that you have to face together and how are you going to approach this? Here, here's a box of objects, um, build something with it, working together. Right. right. And so right. that requires a whole other level of ability in terms of working together, collaboration and, and things like that. You know, I used to work at a nonprofit um, before I went into private practice. I was at a nonprofit for several years working with children with autism spectrum disorder, learning disabilities, ADHD. And um, one of the teachers came to me and said, I'm having problems with my uh, one of my high school classes. Um, this was a, a group of um, children with high function autism and he said they're not motivated, they're not getting along, yada, 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 we'll come and do something. So we actually did a mural with them and mm. it was an interesting challenge to think, okay, how are we going to break down this mural task? Um, now, you know, of course, people aren't going to be making murals at home with their kids, not actual sure, murals, sure. But, but the same idea applies, right? Like getting a big piece of paper and putting it up on the wall, for example. Right? Mm -hmm. How do we approach this task together? How do we break down a large, um, a, a large product, what we're aiming for, into small units, and how do we collaborate through this? Right. So what we found in this situation is that when we asked the kids to work together, they really struggled. They could not work on the same piece of paper together. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we ended up with scribbles and blotches, and and this was in the design, the designing phase of the mural making, right? And so they did come up with a theme and we did that by brainstorming and voting and things like that. And they had a theme of nature. And the next step was them producing imagery. And when we asked them to draw on the same piece of paper, they just weren't able to do that. And so we said, okay, yeah. we got to pull it back, right? They're not yeah. at that point where they can collaborate enough to be on the same piece of paper. So we gave them separate pieces of paper and just said, what do you think of when you think of nature? They each drew their own drawings. And then what we did, we took those drawings and then we asked them to move them around so they could bring them into relationship with each other. Mm -hmm. And so now the tree can be next to the volcano and the lake can be under the volcano and the desert scene can be on the side of the volcano. So then they were able to pull all their individual drawings together into a collaborative. Okay. And then that formed the template for the mural, which then they ended up painting on on an, a wall of the school. Wow. So really breaking it down to even the most fundamental social skill levels. Right. In both cases. Yes. Yes. When that's when that's needed. I really identify where is where is the skill currently at? What do we want to get them to and how can we facilitate this through arts activities? And if something's not working, you back it off a level. That's right. That's right. Okay. The expectation there was too high. They don't have those skills. So let's pull it back. Great. Great. That's, that's fascinating. Very good. Um, so a lot of this, a lot of the, the earlier stuff you were talking about really taught, seems a lot about just getting rid of the high, the amygdala hijack, getting rid of the, the fight or flight. Right. And then, then all sorts of other things will come back online. The ability to communicate. Um, yeah. w what about just general problem solving skills? Is that? Yeah, absolutely. So one way that we can use the art with general problem solving skills is, um, for example, making a comic strip mm -hmm. and asking a child um, to show me what happened here. Like if there's a conflict or problem that happened and we're wanting them to think through this, right? Because when we talk to kids again and we say, like, what happened? Why'd you do that? They're like, uh, I don't know, you know, or they lie <laughs> they make something up <laughs> right, right. or they, or they defend and deflect and blame it on another kid. Right. Oh, because they did da 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 da. Um, right. So if we really want to help them to see, which is a skill cause and effect and understand relationships and how events occur, we can, we can comic strip it out by having different frames and saying, okay, so what happened? Right. And I had, I had one, um, uh, boy once he said uh he said i i got in trouble i said okay so let's draw that i got in trouble 
<clears throat> okay, so what happened before you got in trouble? A kid took my ball. Hmm, okay. So that probably didn't happen right before you got in trouble. Right, There's probably right. a frame of the comet strip missing. So we'll draw that a few frames earlier. Uh -huh. And now we have some frames in between. So it also helps with things like, you know, cognitive um, abilities like sequencing and things like that. Um, but it's really putting the pieces together of what happened. And then once you have that mapped out, and it can be simple, it can be three frames or with this particular kid, I think we were, you know, we had about 20 frames front and back of the paper and he added emojis to each frame of how he was feeling and, and what the feelings were saying and all, you know, all the way along. How, but then, how old was this child? This was a, he was about 12 and he was on the spectrum. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Um, and so once we have that kind of ma mapped out, then we can look at at what point might we change the story, right? And now they can physically see it. They can actually see the visual of the scenario and we can say, where might we do something different? And that's where the problem solving comes in how can we change this picture to change the outcome of the story? Okay. Right. Did, did he not understand the causal effect from what had really happened till the ending or was he just not able to come up with a better solution? Would... Well, in, in the moment or in retrospect? Um, well, when he first told you I got in trouble. Right. At, at that moment. Right. I think that he had th some feelings about what he had done. And mm -hmm. so he was deflecting onto what the other kid had done to him first. Okay. Okay. Um, even though there was an in-between. Right. Which is natural. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, for example, my, my son, you know, not, not too long ago, I heard him berating his younger brother. I have three, three kids mm -hmm. and my older one said something mean to the younger one. And, you know, oftentimes I'll say, Hey, you know, don't say that to your brother. It's really going to hurt his feelings and he's going to start believing you when you call him stupid or, you know, and, blah, 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 blah. and he will say, yeah, but mom, he took my Legos. Right. That's the response. <laughs> right, right. Right. So what I did a couple months ago is I was actually at my computer. I was working on a, preparing a workshop or something. And, and I heard my son in the hallway and he said, you're so stupid or what, something like that. You know, siblings. Sure. And so I said, hey, hey, come here. I want to show you something. So he's like, oh, yeah, what? And so he came in, he sat down, and I pulled open a Word document, and I went into Google Images, and I pulled up a picture of a little boy that was sad, and I copy and pasted it into the Word document. And he's sitting there just watching me, just like, oh, yeah, what are we doing, Mom? And I pulled out a little thought bubble and I in Word document, and I opened it above the little boy's head, the picture of the little boy, and I typed, I'm stupid, I'm an idiot, I'm worthless. And my son's entire body posture changed. He just sunk into the couch, and he said, I'm really sorry, mom. I get it. Right. And so the difference between that and what happens when we talk and right. say, Hey, don't do that. Da, 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 da. Yeah, but, but right. So being able to look at the situation and images can help us to slow down, help kids to slow down, really kind of take in what's going on. So getting back to the previous example, with that client of mine, um, he was aware of what happened and he was aware of why he had been in trouble. Um, and sometimes they're not, but in this particular situation, he was, I think he was just focusing on what the other boy had done to him. Mm -hmm. So in the case of your, your son there, bringing it in, in visually, I think generally we have a, a visual, we're more visual thinkers. So is that one reason why we're, we're just accessing it in a, in a stronger way? Well, it's an interesting question. You know, re re only recently I've come across several individuals who don't have the ability to visualize. Um, and I'm a very visual person. And so that was like, whoa, wait, really? There's people, uh, it actually has a has a name, it's called Aphantasia. It's very um, rare, yeah. Yeah, and, and so th that was interesting to, to encounter. Um, and I encountered a number of clients who, when I would say, okay, well, what if you were, and adults as well, I work with adults as well, where I would say, well, what would that look like? You know, what would that feeling look like if it was a color or a shape or a form? Mm -hmm. And they would say, what do you mean? What do you mean, what does it look like? I said, well, can you visualize that in your imagination? No. So then I started getting curious about that and, and finding that not everybody are visual thinkers and that it's really on a spectrum and that some sure. people are much more visual 
and other people aren't and some people are more literal or more concrete you know i had a situation once going back to my days um working in nonprofit with a boy who was on the spectrum and i said um he drew a dog and i said well what would the dog be saying in this situation and he looked at me like i was crazy and he said it's a dog it doesn't talk and I said, yeah, but let's just pretend. And he's like, but it's a drawing. Drawings don't talk. Right? So he was very concrete. And so I had to adjust the way that I worked with him um, to work within his framework of, yeah, you're right. Dogs don't talk and, and pictures don't talk. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. Um, so um, so my, my bias perspective is, yes, we, we, we do. Well, I was going to say my bias perspective is that, yes, we do tend to to think and, and connect with imagery more, but not everybody does. Um, but I do realize also that it's not just my biased perspective. There has been a lot of research done in terms of um, like memori memorizing things, understanding things that when we bring in more sensory experience around yeah an event or around a fact, if we're trying to learn something at school, if we can bring in pictures and rhythm and rhyme and um, movement, that there's more pathways to access that information. Um, and so we can work with information more readily if, yes, if we bring in the visual or, or other sense experiences. And that goes for changing it as well, not just remembering, but also taking information that's being held and starting to manipulate it by changing how it looks visually. Right. And, and how about spatial awareness? And uh, are those all, to, I've, I think that all of those senses command, uh, come together in our spatial awareness. You know, we, we visualize things in places and, and all of right. that. And so um, you're, of course, representing that in art. <clears throat> um, right. So it, is that helpful? I mean, do you think that that um, that, that becoming an, an abstraction of that spatial awareness is also another way of thinking? For um, yeah, I, I mean, we, we know that um, we, my understanding is, is that, you know, even um, like location, right? That mm -hmm. location is very much associated with um, emotion and emotional memory, yep. um, that we can remember where things happened at certain times, especially if they're emotionally charged, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just sort of awareness of self in space and self in relation to others. I mean, these are all things that we're practicing when we give kids the opportunity to work with tangible um, objects or drawings or things like that is, you know, where am I in relation to everything else, um, which is really a, 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 a quite an amazing tasks that most of us develop naturally but that yeah. for for some it needs to be developed yes it does yeah the uh, uh, i think that like the evolutionary biologists talk about that even our our ability to remember anything our memory was derived from spatial awareness because we needed to remember you know where the where the good uh, berries were and where not to walk in front of the the bear den right so. Right, right. Yeah, when we're working with trauma in particular, this comes to mind that, you know, I always tell people that we can't change what actually happened, but we can change how we hold the information. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, if we're processing a traumatic event from the past or even an adverse event, I mean, now we look at trauma very broadly um, and, and not what we tend to think of as traumatic, but just even adverse childhood events. Um, that when we're starting to think about those things by bringing in other imagery, um, people who maybe weren't even there, but it feels reassuring to be in that person's presence, mm -hmm. to change the location imaginally or through drawing it, um, <clears throat> that we can actually ch start to metabolize the information, hook it up with other neural networks that are more um, positive or adaptive. Uh, I mean... <clears throat> The fight flight system is obviously adaptive, you know, in terms of survival, but sure. in terms of moving forward, right? In terms yeah. of helping us to feel like, okay, I can feel safe when I actually am safe, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have to keep getting triggered in these other situations. So we can play with that. We can change, play with environment. We can play with who is present just by changing those pictures. And what we find is that the body responds to it and goes, oh, I'm okay, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you've, you've talked about the body a couple of times. You said when, when your son saw the picture that his body changed. Oh, yeah. And here you said 
what do you observe when you're going through this in the in the body and posture and sure uh, right yeah that's it's it's really interesting when we start tracking and i do this a lot in my practice tracking very closely and you picked up on that because i guess i'm just sort of naturally talking about it yeah. um that you know the body when it's in a fight flight freeze response the body is is either mobilizing to act um, in some way, either fighting off the danger or running away from it. And so we can see muscle tension, we can see, um, you know, anything from posturing to physically leaving a situation, running away from the situation. Mm -hmm. um, freeze is that, that, that state of, um, I'm helpless. I can't fight it off. I can't run away from it. So I might as well numb out and not feel the pain of being devoured by the tiger, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. And that, I mean, just to be clear with, for your audience, for example, the tiger can be homework. Oh, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. It can be the homework assignment sitting in front of you and the child is going into a fight, flight or freeze state, even though it's not a life or death situation, the part of our brain that assesses threat doesn't distinguish between you, right? Mm -hmm. So when we see the nervous system regulating, right, we start to see, you know, anything from like the breath coming, right? The deeper breath coming just naturally will respond as the system regulates. Um, sometimes the muscles relaxing, less tension in the face, less tension in the hands. Um, you know, sometimes we'll even just see people start to move their neck or open their jaw, uh -huh. right? And they just do it very subtly. And if you bring their attention to it, they'll, they'll be like, oh, was I? Because they're not even noticing sometimes that their body's starting to to go back into a relaxed state of neutrality, essentially. It's getting back into a neutral state, which is the body's way of saying, I'm safe. So when you when you point that out, does that then amplify it? No, it doesn't. Um, not, not typically. Um, it can be, at least in my practice, it can be a little strange at first for people when I'm paying that close attention to them. When they, real um, when they real realize you're paying that, you're, yes. tra you're tracking the physical Yes. Thing, yeah. Probably... And I usually try to let them know in advance, like, so I'm going to let you know when I notice certain things, because it's important for us to notice, you know, if your body starts to change and we're really paying close attention to the body and, and the visuals and, you know, all these different aspects of it. So it doesn't typically amplify it or, or sort of bring that fight flight response back unless there's kind of like a anxiety about being seen which is like, oh, she's paying attention to me, um, which is, you know, sort of its own, its own thing that we work with then. But typically what happens is if I'll say, oh, I just noticed a big breath came, would you like to take another one or not? And I give them the choice. And sometimes, you, most times people will say, yeah, I'd love to take another one. And then they, and then they take another one. Do you model it for them like you just I did? I do. Yeah, mm -hmm. I do. I do a lot of syncing up. There's a lot of research that supports, you know, we we naturally sync up. And this goes back to your questions also about movement and rhythm mm -hmm. um, and music in terms of how we can sync up with, with each other and with our kids through activities and even through drawing as well. There's some simple um, activities that I can share with you where we can sync up with our kids that when we sync up we feel more favorable towards the person um, <clears throat> our mirror neurons light up which are those neurons that feel like I'm doing it even if I'm not doing it I see you drinking the water and my neur mirror neurons light up and say oh I'm kind of thirsty I feel like I'd like to drink some water too mm -hmm. right <clears throat> and that's what they believe is one of the the foundations of empathy um, and feeling yeah. connected with one another. And so when we model or we mirror and we do it with them, so they take a, take a deep breath and I regulate my breathing right with them, right? That it helps to sync us up and help us to feel connected. And then it helps them to regulate even more. Would you go closer to their mental state first and then come out of it to sync up? Or would you just try, try and stay in a stable state yourself that's stronger. an interesting question so throughout therapy sessions i'm closely attuning with whatever state they're in so i'm not actually going into fight flight because i have to stay centered <laughs> right as mm -hmm. the therapist but i'm really closely tracking and attuning what they're feeling mm -hmm. um, by really paying attention to what they're saying their tone of voice their body language etc um, and i will actually inside of me like all if they have a lump sometimes i'll feel the lump in my throat 
as well. And I'll just mm -hmm. notice that, for example. Yeah. yeah. Um, because, you know, when we can feel that feeling and really be in it with them, right? Mm -hmm. That's also the mirroring and that helps them to feel seen and understood in nonverbal ways, right? We know that it's 93% of the message that somebody receives is nonverbal, mm -hmm. right? That's unbelievable. 93% of what I communicate to you right now is my nonverbals. Yes. Right? 7% is what I'm actually saying. Yes. Right? And so when we think about even empathizing with kids and saying, okay, well, I know you're angry, but right? 93% of what they're getting is the nonverbal. Like, yeah, okay, got it. I understand homework's hard, but you have to do it, right? <laughs> they're not even going to hear the I understand homework's hard part. They're going to see yeah. all the nonverbals. So hint, hint to podcast listeners, they need to see the video part of it. <laughs> this, this one. <laughs> right? And which is why as parents and as professionals, right, we really need to stay regulated as, as much as possible um, because they're not even at that point when we're saying, I get it. I get that homework is hard for you, right? They're hearing the tone of voice. They're seeing mm -hmm. the tension in our body. They're maybe seeing the frown on our face, right? And they probably yep. Even hear the part where you said, I understand homework's hard for you. Because the 93% yeah. was so loud and clear, they're going to escalate more and just go more and more into fight flight. Right, right. right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%, totally. So <laughs> this sounds like something that parents could really work on as a skill. Is, Absolutely. Uh, can you give a, a little advice to parents on how to hold that mental state or, or what should they do? Sure. So, you know, one is just understanding that, right? And checking in with our own bodies. I think the body is a really good place to start, right? And, and notice consistent cues that we're feeling escalated. You know, mine, my brow fur furrows. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that. I tend to hold my breath and I, and I get tense in my shoulders, right? I know that, that that's where I'm going to feel it first, right? right but you're, so you're pretty body aware, Yes. I don't, I don't think that that's very typical. Sure, sure. Well, and that takes practice, right? right. So uh -huh. some of it, and, and then we can back it up further and further, okay. right? So when we're in the moment, it starts with, I'm in the moment, oh, my voice is escalated, right? Mm -hmm. And noticing that, or even after the moment, frankly, that's where it usually starts. And believe yeah. me, I've, I have plenty, I live and breathe this stuff, and I still, you know, I don't use it 100% of the time. <laughs> Right. Yeah, it's, you know, it's because, a practice. <laughs> it is, and it's and it's and it's hitting the reset button over and over again, and saying, "Okay, you know what?" But there's the repair also. You know, frankly, I think the best place to practice is after there has been a, a disruption. You know, in connection with the child, is acknowledging our part in that, and and being able to go back and say, "Hey, you know what? I maybe didn't handle that very well." Okay. Right. Uh -huh. And being able to do that. And, you know, to go back to using the art, for example, you know, there's um, an example that I share a lot with my son where I had, you know, I was not in my best mommy moment place and um, had blamed him for a conflict between him and his sister and, you know, had gotten frustrated. Him. Anyways, he went into his room and he slammed the door and I went and I knocked and I said, look, I'm really sorry. You know, I'm repairing. I said, I understand you're angry. I'm acknowledging his feelings. It's okay that you're angry. I'm inviting him to be angry at me. I'm okay with that. You mm -hmm. know, so I'm acknowledging his feelings. I'm normalizing his feelings. I'm accepting them and I'm taking responsibility. And he wanted none of it. He was like, I hate you. Go away. Leave me alone. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And so in that moment, what I did is I went and I got a piece of paper and I drew a sad face and I wrote, I'm sorry. And then I drew another circle and I slipped it underneath the door. Mm -hmm. And then he drew a sad face and wrote, I'm sorry. And he slipped it back under the door to mm -hmm. me. And then he opened the door and gave me a big hug. Nice. And then we were able to talk about it. So that's where the visual arts can come back in, right? Because even again, when we're going and saying, hey, I'm sorry about what happened, or can we do that over? Can we think about how to do it differently? This is all talk, 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 talk. And we have to connect before we communicate. We have to connect before we communicate, right? Yes. So, so getting back to your question about what parents can do, you know, some of it too is starting with acknowledging our own feelings mm -hmm. and what's being triggered inside of us and maybe even taking a moment to do our own sort of um, experiment and visualization in terms <laughs> of a metaphor that okay. might connect with that feeling. 
Um, I had a moment I was, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. How do you use metaphors? I was just going to say that I had a moment with my, my son where I was feeling very stuck in, in sort of a perpetual conflict and, and I didn't know how to get out of it. I didn't know what to do differently. I thought I was doing all the right things in terms of how to deal with it. And, you know, and nothing was changing. And that's a good clue that we can drop into a more creative place, right? When nothing seems to be working, even if we think we're doing everything that we can mm-hmm. possibly do. And so what I did is I thought to myself, okay, what would this look like? If I were to draw this, what would it look like? Or if I were to assign a picture to this, what would this look like? And the image of a brick wall came to mind, right? Mm-hmm. And then I thought, okay, well, what's the, an- what's the antidote to the brick wall? then what would I like to do to this brick wall or what does it need or and then I I kind of had the image of the brick wall like opening up right like Mm -hmm. gates almost like open arms and then that inspired this this idea of again maybe instead of approaching my son explaining to him why his behavior and telling him what he needs to do differently I just need to go to him with open arms Uh and so the next time the conflict occurred which is you know you can predict it it's going to happen again right as I went to him with open arms and I just gave him a hug. Okay. Right? So the, the mind for, mind metaphor is for your own mindset. That's right. To shift how we're feeling. Because really I was feeling walled off. I was feeling uh, like I had this brick wall inside of me. And I was feeling disconnected from my son. And so it helped me to shift how I could approach the moment. The conflict was still there. Uh-huh. Right? And it still needed to be addressed. But I can change how I felt internally by, by feeling more open in that moment and being able to approach him with more compassion and uh-huh. more openness about his emotional experience in this situation. Mm-hmm. And by doing that, he was able to connect with me. And then we were able to start problem solving how to address it differently. When your emotional state was different, was his then immediately different? Yes. Yes. Yeah, nice. because he felt, felt, he felt seen and, and heard and understood. Okay. Like That's... authentically felt, right? Yeah, from a, yeah, yeah. I... From, from a felt place, a body <laughs> place, yeah, an emotional place. Uh-huh. Of dropping into that, right? And a lot of times what happens is when kids are in defense mode, then we go into defense mode, mm-hmm. right? Because everyone's just frustrated and everybody just feels stuck. Yeah, yeah. Right. But if, we, but if we really look at what frustration is, it's really a defense. It's almost always a defense uh-huh. to something more vulnerable. Yes. Right. A fear, usually for parents, you know, there's usually a fear mm-hmm. underneath the frustration. Absolutely. Right. And so if we can acknowledge that also um, and, and sort of soothe that. I was working with a father once who had a child with severe special needs. And um, when the, the child would be tantruming, um, the father would sit outside the room to wait for it to de-escalate because that was really all they could do. Um, we talked about coming up with a metaphor that he could use to kind of, you know, ride the wave, essentially, of the screaming and the tantruming of his son, rather than just sitting there and clenching and just tolerating it like his, you know, like he was being hit in the head every time his kid screamed, you know, Mm. it felt like that. And so instead, he came up, he actually came up with this metaphor, riding the waves, right? And instead, he transformed it to waves going over him and crashing and waves going over him and crashing. And it became a soothing metaphor for him that he could sit with. And just letting the waves just come over him every time the child would scream. And so that he could stay regulated rather than gripping around the experience and becoming, you know, um, frustrated and angry and, 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 you know, incapacitated really in how to help his, his son. Wow. So changing emotional state is really, really powerful stuff. The other person just, it's almost impossible for them to continue to react and they can't react the way they were if your if your state changes. Yes, that's right. We're changing the script. Changing the script, right. That's right. You know, you say your line, I say my line. You say your line, I say my line. You say your line and I look at my script and I say, you know, I'm going to throw my script out. I'm going to do something differently. And and usually what happens is the other person goes, "Well, wait a minute. They're not saying their lines. Maybe I should say mine louder." Because mm-hmm. maybe they're going to pick up their script again. And so sometimes we see the behaviors escalate. 
yeah. before uh -huh. they calm down because they're like, well, I'm just going to keep on with my script because if I say it louder and more intensely, then maybe they'll catch on and do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. But if we keep not picking up that script, then eventually they're going to say, well, shoot, my script doesn't work anymore either. Yep. Yep. I have seen on numerous occasions, um, I've got 30 years of Kung Fu background. I, I've taught it professionally for 20 years. All right. And so when I get in, I've been into a, a violent situation. Um, usually I, I, I don't have the fear reaction because I go into like a, my training of just the Mushim state. And I have seen situations where you just know something was gonna go down really, really bad. Mm -hmm. And three minutes later, the guy's apologizing to me for his reaction. Right. I mean, a guy that was just fists up, angry, was going to punch me in the face. And just like, and then he's going, I don't know what came over me. Sorry, dude. You know? <laughs> right. Because his nervous system got regulated somehow, right? The, exactly. The, either he co-regulated off of your regulated system or... He did, well, I'm, I'm, he's getting a reaction from me. I'm usually smiling. Right. Um, he's getting a very, very unexpected reaction from me. Yeah. And, well, and that brings up an interesting point, too, just in terms of doing something unexpected. Yes. Um, that even that, you know, what? Huh? You know, that, that throws people enough sometimes to kind of shake them out of that, that pattern. And that's where sure. the art and music and things like that can come in. I mean, sometimes in my house, you know, if the kids are bickering or whatever sometimes i'll just say dance party and i'll just put music on and i'll just get up and start dancing and they're like what like what are you doing mom like it's so weird you know uh -huh. and, but i don't care i was like it's dance time we obviously need to dance something off i don't know what it is but let's just dance and sometimes they will they'll actually get up and join in and um and start dancing along and now we're kind of back to parallel play you know we couldn't get along sitting at the table talking but now we can share our moves with each other and dance next to each other and so now we're reconnecting in a more positive way and you know but that that initial and music and you know which elevates mood and and, and yeah. all of that's kind of coming into play here um but that initial like what are you what are you doing you know i was teaching a workshop in north dakota for a group of teachers and counselors who were working on the reservations with um you know very traumatized children and this one woman got up to do a role play with me and um and she was an escalated you know teenager in this role play mm -hmm. and um they they decided they really wanted to test me they're like yeah you and your drawings your you know you and your <laughs> art like you don't know how it really is in the schools like what we're really up against so this woman she got up and she was like F this and F that and pacing and role playing yeah. this kid. And she got, she took a chair and she threw the chair. Yeah. And all the teachers in the room started applauding her. They're like, that's how it is. Yeah, how are you gonna address that with art, you know? And mm -hmm. and so I, I, I took a piece of paper and I walked over to her and I was like, hey, I wanna show you something. Mm -hmm. And even in that, and I started drawing and she, even in her role playing self, she said, I actually felt something shift inside of me. Mm -hmm. As soon as you came over and did something that I was not expecting, right, because I am used to, like, as that child, I'm used to adults coming over to me and telling me to calm down, to stop, to, you know, go to the principal's office, to whatever, but you did something different, and I actually, in that moment, felt something shift inside of me when you said, hey, so-and-so, I want to show you something, and you started drawing. Mm -hmm. You got my attention and I was interested and I started to feel calmer. Right. Is, hey, I want to show you something, your go-to? In escalated situations, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a pattern interrupt in itself, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And it evokes curiosity. Yep. And it, it's, it's inviting. Mm -hmm. It's often collaborative, right? If, I, if you say to somebody, I want to talk to you, Immediately, That's, defenses go up. I've yeah. done something wrong, and I'm in trouble. Right? Even if it's a good thing, my husband does this. Right? I go, I go into. I'm like, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? He's like, yeah, what, what, what? <laughs> and I was like, I, just, I just thought we should figure out what we're gonna have for dinner. You didn't do it, right? <laughs> but we have this like instinct of, oh no, I did something wrong. Yeah. Um, but if we say to somebody, I want to show you something, right? All of a sudden, it kind of evokes this feeling of like, oh, like. Or I want to do something with you. That's the other one. Come here, I want to do something with you. Mm -hmm. 
right? I, I have this, this thing that I think is kind of neat. Maybe you won't think it's neat, but I kind of think it's neat. Can I show uh -huh. it to you? Yeah, yeah. Right? Suddenly yeah, it's like you want to do something. It's like a present, right? Yep. It's very cool. And we can be addressing the exact same issue, but visually instead of talking about it. But now they've decreased their, you know, their defenses. They're more regulated already. They're feeling more connected, so they're more open. Do you have a smart child who is struggling in school? Are you feeling overwhelmed? Do you feel like the struggle is holding your child back from their true potential? Maybe the anxiety and worry over your child's future just beats you down every day. You don't have to live that way. Learn how to stop a learning disability from becoming a life disability. A child with a learning disability is stressful for the child and the parent. The disability may be eroding their confidence and shattering their self-esteem. Other people may perceive your child as unintelligent and antisocial. If not addressed and fixed early, the child may develop permanent challenges later in life when looking for a good job or meeting a potential spouse. Our current school system does not know how to properly help our children, but at Learning Success, we do. We've created a system you can easily do at home with your child. And with just 15 minutes per day after school with your child, you can save them from a life of struggle and heartbreak. Learn how to unleash your child's potential and embrace their true intelligence. As a special gift for being a loyal podcast listener, we're going to give you a free trial of the Learning Success System. Try it out absolutely free for 15 days. If it is not the perfect fit to help your child succeed in school and in life, just cancel before the trial ends and pay nothing. You even get to keep the free bonuses. Go to www.learningsuccesssystem.com forward slash podcast to get your free trial now. You'll be so happy you did once you see the great grades your child is capable of getting. Imagine being so proud of your child when they bring home a great report card and hand it over with a beaming smile. Get your free trial now at www.learningsuccesssystem.com forward slash podcast. You've got nothing to lose except the stress and anxiety that is holding you and your child down. I'll see you there. you carry paper and uh, crayons or something with you all the time? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually had a parent at a workshop ask me, she said, so how does this work in the car? <laughs> she said to you that she asked me to say, well, she's like, do you have like crayons and paper in the car and you like pull over and you draw? And I said, no, realistically not. But I will do other things like, you know, shifting attention to looking at the clouds and finding pictures in the clouds. Okay. Or making up silly stories so that if my kids, for example, are squabbling in the car, um, then I'll start to try to create them as a team against me instead mm -hmm. of against each other, right? So I try to bring that unit together and I'll do it through silly stories. So I'll say, okay, you guys, I'm going to get my hot air balloon and I'm going to tie it to the back of the car and you guys can sit in the hot air balloon and you can just, I'll just drive along and you sit in the hot air balloon and you guys can fight all you want. But now they start to team up against me and say like, well, we're just going to slide down the string and get back in the car then. And then I say, okay, well then I'll, I'll have to, you know, make the string longer. Mm -hmm. And then they say, well, then we'll just cut the string and we'll land and we'll climb out and we'll get back in the car. And I was like, okay, well, then I'll make it a chain. And now it becomes a game. Right. Right. And now they're not fighting anymore. Yeah. Right. So there's different kinds of creative things, just kind of thinking outside the box um, that we can do to shift the moment. Um, mm -hmm. Putting on music, doing rhythms, clapping games. I've done that in the car. Um, all right. <clears throat> we're going to do a clapping game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, so we're going to go around and each one of you does a rhythm and see if the other person can match the rhythm, right? And so now what we're doing is we're using sort of that inherent um, value of, of syncing up, right, with rhythm. 
yeah. in in the car. So now we're having to listen and attune to the other person by listening to their rhythm and trying to match it, right? Without right. even having to talk about conflict resolution. No, but it's cooperative. That's right, and it's cooperative. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Okay, so uh, I know you've uh, you had um, a lot of children with uh, autism, ADHD, um, and different learning differences. Um, so typically those children are starting to feel like they're not intelligent. They've right. got a lot, lot of anxiety. I think that's a very, very common situation. Yeah. How would you get them to not feel stupid? <laughs> right, right. So one, so going back to the idea of externalizing, so there's lots of different ways. Going back to the idea of externalizing, you know, one is we can externalize the part of them that says you're stupid, right? So again, we're giving them some distance between who they are and what their thoughts are, okay. right? And we can educate them about the brain and how the brain's job is to spit out thoughts. And some of them are helpful and kind, and some of them are not very helpful mm. and not very kind, right? I like to use the analogy that the, the the brain makes thoughts like the mouth makes saliva, right? And our brain just, just spits out thoughts all the time. So we can become less attached to our thoughts and we can also identify less with our thoughts, mm -hmm. right? Now that can be sort of a sophisticated idea for some kids, you know, older kids and higher functioning kids, you know, might be able to understand that. With the drawing though, it's show me that part of you, you know, when that, when it says you're stupid or you're not good enough, right? Can you show me what that guy looks like? Can you show me what that character looks like? It could be a shape, it could be a color, it can be a form, it can be a, some character, it could be an emoji, right? So we're externalizing that. And now we can bring in a helpful or reassuring thought, okay. right? So, so who, so if we wanted to give this guy a friend, right, who would that be? What would that friend say? Because usually kids are much, and adults as well, right? We're able to be very empathic and, and helpful to other people, but not so much with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so that process allows the child to start developing a more helpful thought rather than us telling them, no, you're not stupid, you're, right? That we want them to develop that part of themselves and to be able to really identify um, that they do have a voice inside that can be reassuring, um, that can say, hey, it's okay, just, just try your best. And that they can both be there and that maybe they have a dialogue. And that's what's so beautiful about the art is we can actually have them both on the page at the same time, having a conversation with one another. Okay. Right? Um, for example, other things are things like, you know, making, um, making a, a jar at home or in the classroom for mistakes. Um, and learning from mistakes so we can reframe um, mistakes as something positive. Um, uh, you know, uh, in my own home, we had a um, mistake puffball cup. Okay. And so every day for, you know, it, it didn't last super long because I kind of fell off, which we do, but you know, for a couple of weeks, we would talk about mistakes that we made during the day that we learned from. And so mm -hmm. it became a positive. And so if you made a mistake and you learned from it, then you got a puff ball and you got to put the puff ball in the cup. Right. Okay. And so it started to get to the point where the kids were like, Oh, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. Really? <laughs> and, and I, and I, and I did this intervention at home because one of my kids is, is a bit of a perfectionist and gets very, very hard on himself and very frustrated with himself um, when he makes mistakes or when things don't look exactly how he wanted them to. Um, so I started doing these kind of reframing activities at home where we said like, you know what, actually mistakes can be really positive. Um, and so our challenge as a family was, could we fill up the, the cup with puff balls? Mm -hmm. And then I would model it. Okay, I, may, I would make it up, right? Um, okay, I made a mistake today. I was at work and I forgot that I was supposed to call somebody. And so then I remembered that next time I should put it on my schedule, right? I'll just make it up. Like, yay, I made a mistake. Yay, put it in there. Right. right. Um, so those are ways also to start reframing experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and then a third thing that comes to mind is just through art activities themselves, where we can focus less on product and focus more on process. Okay. Um, because what we're doing there is modeling the importance of process and troubleshooting and trial and error. And it doesn't matter what it looks like in the end. It's really about the process. So the more opportunities we give kids outside of academics to experience process-oriented tasks, 
where the product doesn't matter, mm -hmm. the more they can rehearse that understanding of how to approach things in general in life. Okay. Yeah. The, the exercise with the, it uh, sounds like a very good thing to promote growth mi mindset that's the right. kids and teach them, um, which I, I know that's a, that's a really important thing for parents. A, a lot of parents work on, on developing how growth mindset skills. Right. Uh, that's awesome. And so again, it concretizes it. It makes it concrete for the yeah. child, right? Yeah. And, and we sometimes miss that part. We can educate kids about grit. We can educate kids about growth mindset. But unless they have something physical to attach it to and to see it physically and to be able to manipulate and do something with it, it doesn't really integrate. We're only talking to the thinking part of the brain. Yeah. Right. But we yeah. want them to be able to embody that experience and really know what that feels like. Another sense as well. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about the um, drawing the characters, the one that said "I'm stupid" and then the, and the the friend, um, yeah. is that really drawing into their subconscious and getting the subconscious to come out and and speak a little bit more? That often happens when we're making art. Uh, that often happens. I'll tell people actually, you don't need to know; just put something down, right? Mm -hmm. Because it comes from a different part of the brain. It's not coming from the knowing part of the brain. Because sometimes people will say, just earlier today, I had a client and she goes like, I don't, I don't know what it would say. Yeah. And I said, that's okay. You don't need to know what it says. Just, you know, like here, let's draw a word bubble and just write what it would say. And then she wrote it. She was able yeah. to write it when she stopped trying to figure it out. And, and sometimes people will try to edit and say, especially adults, right? They'll kind of edit themselves and go like, well, that doesn't really make any sense. I'll go tell me anyways. Because uh, <laughs> you know? especially if you're trying to edit it, it's probably really important. <laughs> that is, a, I've been through similar stuff and that is a really profound experience. Like who's talking, who's doing this, mm -hmm. you know? Those, mm -hmm. If you let it. Let it. Right. Uh, and so sometimes where that comes from is, you know, we can call it the unconscious, we can call it implicit experience or implicit memory, you know, it's mm -hmm. that blueprint. It's our blueprint of life, right? It's not, yeah. it's not necessarily explicit memories of what I had for breakfast or what I remembered happened last time at Aunt Betty's house or whatever. But, you know, or when I was at school the other day, those are the explicit memories. The implicit memories are our, our blueprint of, of our relationships and ourself in the world. Uh -huh. Right. And so a lot of times when we say, don't try to figure it out, just allow the answer to come or just draw it or just write it, then it'll come. Right. And that comes from that implicit memory place and that our knowledge about our beliefs about who we are and who we are in this world. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. we can work with it once once it's out and it's and it's there and, and and in a workable fashion, you know, especially if we put it in a visual form or in a written form. Now we can do something with it. Uh huh. How accepting are people of these, this modes of therapy? Are they? I mean, I, I remember a time in my life where I would listen to this and I'm like, oh, no way, you know? <laughs> right. but, but now I'm like, it makes total sense. You know? Right. Well, you know, I think that a, a few things, I think that, that things have really changed. I mean, they have. I mean, psychology has changed a lot, obviously, since its inception. And even in the last, you know, 10 to, to 20 years from, you know, the self-esteem movement when we were telling people, um, you know, well, if you feel bad about yourself, just tell yourself the opposite. You know, I like myself. Um, and then, of course, you know, decade of, of, you know, or decade plus of that um, and people feeling worse <laughs> and, and, yeah. and feeling what's wrong with me. Why isn't this working? And then really looking at the research on it and saying, gosh, you know, this is so what we call ego dystonic. It's not lining up with my perception of myself. So mm -hmm. I can think it, but I don't feel it. And, and you can't. You can't change a feeling that way. And so now we've moved towards a place of befriending emotions. And I think that's really come with like the mindfulness mo movement mm -hmm. is saying that we can sit with our emotions. We can befriend our emotions. Um, we can have a relationship. So, you know, I think there, there are a lot more people are, are, are not only open and accepting, um, but intrigued and eager for um, different modalities and different approaches like what we're talking about here. I get a lot of, with my adult clients, I get a lot of adults who come to me after years and years and years of talk therapy. And mm. they come in saying, you know, well, I've been in talk therapy my whole life for the last 10 years or for seven years or 15 years. And I say, how'd that work for you? And they go, well, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still coming to therapy. Um, 
Right. And, and that a lot of people see a lot faster change. And in terms of workshops, you know, we're doing a lot of workshops based off of the book for um, schools, for example, after school programs, um, teaching teachers how to use some of this in the classroom. Um, and, and lots of people are coming up to us afterwards saying this is so needed. Um, we really understand the brain more. We understand trauma more now. And we understand that, you know, of course, we don't want to throw talking out we need to talk um but that sure. is really not the most efficient or effective way always to to change how we feel uh on the inside so i find people are, are more and more and more even since i began my career um to now there's a lot more awareness um of these different ways of working and um and a lot of excitement around around it interesting interesting yeah, yeah that's fantastic um so we, we have a, a an online dyslexia test on, on our, and, and so I gathered up all the data. And one of the things I found interesting is that some of the questions we asked, which were geared, they weren't, we asked, is your child experiencing anxiety? And then an, mm -hmm. there were other questions we asked that would point to the fact that they might be experiencing anxiety. Sure. Right. And from that data, it looked to me like a lot of, uh, there was a, uh, fewer parents said yes my parent child is is experiencing anxiety than showed us that marked off symptoms of anxiety mm -hmm. what are the things that a parent would should look for like physically to to know that their child is experiencing anxiety right yeah it's a really good question and, and it can look different in different kids because sometimes and I think that's maybe why parents say no my child is not experiencing anxiety is because whatever their their framework of what anxiety looks like might be different than how it's actually manifesting in their child mm -hmm. so you know remembering that for example even aggressive behavior can be a symptom of anxiety Mm -hmm. Right, that um, that anxiety is not necessarily um, what we would call like a flea response, right? Uh, yeah. Or talking about being nervous or identifying worries, um, but we might have, you know, anger might come in to to help us feel more empowered in that situation, for example. Mm -hmm. And so it might look like angry outbursts. Mm -hmm. um, when really underneath, if we were to remove the anger, underneath would be anxiety, uh -huh. right? So typically right. An, an angry response or an outburst type of response, um, you know, typically is protecting from a more vulnerable experience, which would be, you know, sadness, feelings of worthlessness, anxiety, things like that. Mm -hmm. So I think understanding that there's many layers to anxiety and many layers to feelings that just because uh -huh. you might not be seeing anxiety, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's not really the root cause. Mm -hmm. um, but other things like avoidance, I mean, that's sort of a classic um, in terms of anxiety, avoiding Okay. situations avoiding homework avoiding and avoidance though even looks different for different kids right making excuses i don't want to and so i hear a lot from parents he's just not motivated um they're lazy i'm sure you hear that a lot yeah yeah um, <clears throat> you know um they um they'd rather be playing their video games and, and all those you know the, the video game one might be true you know i don't believe in lazy <clears throat> you know no, no. but um it might be true i mean that's a preferred activity they might prefer that um but to the extent that they're now avoiding other things right so that's what we want to look at is could this could this be an avoidant tactic um so that they don't have to approach this thing that's making them uncomfortable yeah, so there was some other data in that, that um, so the, the questionnaire was for, for parents um, as a screener for dyslexia. And in the boys, the ages of the parent of the boys that the parents were taking the, the screener for were in the seven to nine year old range. Uh -huh. The girls were 16 and up. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where that so my thinking there is that girls are just simply more skilled socially at avoidance because they they're um well their social skills are better at those ages and they can right um w would you concur with that is that yeah i think so and the other thing that comes to mind is and this is a generalization but there is something to it right uh -huh. that 
boys tend to be what we call externalizers in terms of their emotions and girls tend to be internalizers. Okay. So girls tend to hold their emotions in, mm-hmm. right? And boys tend to externalize their emotions through um, usually behavioral problems, conflict, mm-hmm. you know, aggression, um, high energy activities, things like that. Yeah, so they, the girls just don't get recognized when mm-hmm. they're having when they're having a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is a big problem. <laughs> that's right. A, that, uh, that's right. Yeah. So what, um, what's interesting in neuroscience today that, that influences you? What were the, what are the most in, inter, interesting things in, in the neuroscience field? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, gosh, we're, we're learning so much right now. I feel like it's such a, a wonderfully exploding area. It, I'm very interested is. in interpersonal in neurobiology uh-huh. um, and, and how we were talking about before, sort of co-create experience um, mm-hmm. just by how what we bring into the situation ourselves and uh-huh. how we can really help change the brain, how we can change the other person. Um, I mean, they're doing it, they're doing it themselves, but how we can co-create those experiences to allow sort of optimal conditions so that the other persons can start to change how they hold information, how they can feel about themselves, their relationships in the world around them. So that's a really interesting growing areas that interpersonal neurobiology um, field, um, you know, people, people ask me, you know, how it is that I do what I do, you know, sitting with a lot of really difficult um, stories, difficult emotional material. Uh, and, and it, you know, I've thought a lot about it and I thought, well, you know, cause I don't, I don't see it as, um, it, it doesn't feel traumatic. It doesn't feel sad because I see people every day changing every single day. I see okay. people changing, um, uh-huh. and, and feeling better about themselves and, and making changes in their relationships and making changes in their lives. Um, that I actually see it very uplift. My profession is very uplifting in that sense. Um, and that goes back to your question about neurobiology. You know, I see it sort of in real time every day, um, that we can change our brains. I mean, it's that, it's that simple that we can change our brains and that's, what's so amazing. Yep. Yeah, that is, it really is. And that, that has not, that has not been well known for, for very long. It's that's right. so, so it, recent. Relatively speaking, it really hasn't. I mean, we used to think that, you know, our brains stopped developing that, you know, what, 18 when we became adults, you know, legally yeah. and yeah. your brain stops developing. And now we know that the, the cortical brain doesn't stop developing until we're, you know, doesn't fully, isn't fully developed until we're 26 years old. Yep. Right. And then from there that we can change our brains our entire lives and rewire networks and um, have new experiences and internally. And uh, it is a relatively new area. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. I think that it, it was it actually goes back into the 1800s where there were experiments that hinted at it. And then but not until the late 90s where it really, really started catching on. Right. And, and right. Even, even today, I think that the opposite, that 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 falsehood that we can't is still stuck, stuck in our society. Well, you um, know, it's, um, it's interesting because I see a strong dichotomy right now, you know, that there are there is still that 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 belief that this these are sort of, you know, characterological, you know, experiences that we have that you can't change. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the and, and I mean, we've had for so long this sort of state, you know, um, model of like this is how you are this is the person you are this is your level of intelligence it's stuck it's static it's not going to change right and now we know about growth mindset and how we can change the brain in all kinds of different ways and yet on the other side of the pendulum like swinging way over to the other side is what's happened with positive psychology which i think has done a lot of good on the one hand in terms of helping us to look at what is good um quote unquote right good and and healthy um, you know, what is happiness? How do we experience joy? What is joy? Rather than just looking through a medical lens, sort of medical model lens at like depression and anxiety and what's wrong, what's wrong with us, what's, what's wrong with this person. Yeah. But being right. able to now look at even troubling or difficult emotions like anxiety and depression and anger is actually positive, that they have an adaptive um, role in our lives, that they are here for a reason, mm-hmm. um, and that we can understand them in the greater context of who we are as human beings. So that's all positive. But what I see as not so healthy in terms of what has um, 
come out of the positive psychology movement is this idea that you can change your thoughts has gone all the way to the idea of, well, you can just stop being depressed or stop being anxious. Just change your thoughts. Be grateful. Just mm -hmm. have gratitude. If you just had gratitude, then you wouldn't be anxious. And I'm seeing lots and lots of people coming in, adults, teens, um, especially who come in and say, you know, my parents tell me I should just be grateful. My parents say I should just look, on, look at positive things in my life. Why can't I just do that? And the problem is, is while there is research that supports that things like gratitude can elevate our mood and help to deal with things like depression, anxiety, the problem is it's much more complicated than that most of the time. And uh -huh. so just being grateful doesn't make the problem go away. Just being grateful doesn't make us less anxious or less depressed if okay. there is a real underlying right and usually there is there's there's an underlying reason why anxiety is here and so by just being grateful or just having a positive outlook we're actually repressing those feelings that have something important to tell us about our experience and the longer we repress that probably the worst things the worst is going to get right? that's right that's right. I've seen adults come in after, you know, having had experiences as teens, for example, where they were told, you know what, you just need to not be angry. You just need to, you know, there's so much beauty, of, beauty in life. This is all true, right? There's so much beauty mm -hmm. in life. Like, don't be angry, right? And I have actually had people come in and say, and so I chose not to be angry. I just one day woke up and said, you know what, I'm not going to be angry anymore. I'm going to love myself. I'm going to love life. And I'm just going to not be angry anymore. And then you know, X number of years later, and they're in my office saying, I'm having intrusive, violent thoughts. Um, I, I feel really unsettled and I don't know why, mm -hmm. um, right? And it's because something wasn't actually taken care of. It wasn't addressed. There's a bigger wound there and we just stuck a bandaid over it and we've ignored everything that's underneath the surface. Yeah, yeah. And so you, you really need a modality such as yours or uh, the movement. What 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 other methods? I mean, well, so in the in are... the realm of the creative arts therapies, there is visual art therapy, music, poetry, okay. Um, okay. move dance and movement. There's drama therapy also. That's within the creative arts therapies as well. Drama. I hope therapy. I haven't forgotten anybody. I don't want to leave anybody out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So would what would a person? Where would they start? Would they pick one? To, I mean. Are some better for uh, certain conditions, different personality types, or? Sure, I get, uh, you know, especially with uh, kids that I work with, oftentimes, not always, uh, they'll, the parent will see some kind of inclination towards art. A lot okay. of times I get calls from people saying, um, you know, either they were referred to me or they say, you know what, my kid really likes art. I think that this might be a good approach for them. It's already a passion, right? Right. Yeah. So I think some of it is looking at that, you know, when you're looking at the creative arts therapies. Um, but I'll, I'll even broaden it and say there's so many different types of, of, of approaches now, um, including body-based, somatic-based approaches, mm -hmm. um, which the arts do access and tap into, but there's, you know, even more specific somatic-based approaches. Um, that um, there's trauma-based approaches like EMDR, for example, um, which is a whole nother podcast for another time. Uh -huh. um, but that's something else that I'm trained in and that I use, which is um, a, a trauma-informed practice. What is EMDR? Uh, just EMDR stands for eye movement desensitization and oh, reprocessing. Right, yeah. right. I read about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, but even with that, you know, sort of integrating EMDR with my art my art therapy background. I do a lot of integration of visual um, with with the techniques and tools that we have from EMDR. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're looking for a specific help with from a counselor, from a therapist, you know, it's asking questions. It's I always it's a, really encourage parents just to call and say, this is what's going on with my son. This is what's going on with my daughter. How might you approach this? And then mm -hmm. let the therapist speak um, and call several and vet them and see what feels like it's going to align the most with your child. But I have a very strong bias that sitting and talking alone is not going to get you very far. Oh yeah. And, and that makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. We, uh, you know, my background, like I said, 30 years in Kung Fu, in my early days of it, 
um, we got a lot of angry young men uh -huh. just that had had severe trauma, yeah. sexual trauma we, or whatever, um, alcoholism. Um, we had a lot of soldiers with PTSD. Mm -hmm. And yeah, back then, this, this is 30 years ago, I knew nothing about any of this back then. I was just simply teaching Kung Fu. But we noticed just dramatic changes. Yeah. Dramatic changes. And we thought it had a lot to do with the center line, body posture. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's a particular motion and a particular way of, of moving your body that is extremely strong. Mm -hmm. um, and we call it bone alignment or flowing focus chi. And what we saw is that now what I realize is it, is it switches them from a freeze or flight into more of a, it's not a, it, it, it is teaching them fighting, but it's, it's like a, a go get it attitude. It just uh -huh. a mental switch that happens as soon as they hit those body alignments. Right. And, you know, for, for 20 years, I had them coming at, after me afterwards going, I don't know, you know, what happened in the last hour, but before I walked in, I was suicidal and now I feel great, you know, so. Right, right. Completely through body mechanics. Visualization was a big part of that. Yeah. Because we, we use visualization in the training ext extensively, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, had a, I had a client come in um, who was suicidal and it was, I mean, she was like, no, I'm gonna do it. I'm like, I don't even wanna be here. She didn't wanna come into my office. She was sitting in the waiting room. Um, and you know, I was talking, I was assessing, I was doing my due diligence. And then I just said, you know what, let's just look around. Let's just stop talking for a moment and let's just look around and just, is there anything in this waiting room that catches your eyes? And she goes, yeah, I like that, that piece of art over there. And then I said, yeah, what do you, what do you notice about it? And we just started talking about the colors and the textures and the color came back to her face. And she started to take deeper breaths and she started to calm down. And then I, you know, her stomach started grumbling because the digestive tract comes back online as well when we're yeah. regulating. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I said, I'm wondering if you're hungry. And she said, yeah, I am, I haven't eaten. And she had a little bag of food with her. And I said, would you like to eat something? And she started eating. And then I checked back in, I said, how are you doing? And she said, I don't really wanna kill myself. Uh, right, and so she was in that free state. I mean, suicidality is a free state, is a dissociative state. It's the state of helplessness. I can't fight. I can't run away, and so I might as well numb out. I might as well cut it off. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but as her nervous system started to re-regulate again, then she was able. The thinking part of her brain was able to come back online and say, "No, I don't want to do that," because she was no longer in freeze. Wow. Yeah, that's that's pretty powerful. Yeah. So we're we're truly different people when we're in that other part of our brain. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, which brings us to mindfulness. What types of mindfulness practice do you, are you interested in or, or recommend or, or that? So I, I think finding something that works for you, that works for your child, you know, or for the adults that works for them. I think that right. people are very quick to say, well, that doesn't work for me. And then they don't do it. You know, I can't meditate. I hear that a lot. Oh, I tried meditation. It doesn't work for me. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and usually what people are thinking about is sitting there clearing your mind, quote unquote, focusing on your breath. Um, and for some people actually focusing on their breath as a trigger. Uh, yeah. if, if people have anxiety, for example, that's often where our anxiety lives is in the chest and breath area is where we feel it very strongly. And so if we tell somebody to focus on their breath, then they might start to panic even more. Right. Yeah. I've seen studies uh, that talk about meditation being actually pretty bad for people that are in high anxiety states. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And so we wanna find something that works for you. And there's a lot of different ways. I think one is understanding that mindfulness is different than meditation. Meditation is a practice to cultivate mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like we go to the gym in order to get stronger. Right. Yeah. Um, but the gym is in and of itself is not being stronger. Right. It's, it's, yeah. it's a way that we can practice it. And so meditation is just one way to practice being mindful and, and to clarify being mindful is being aware of whatever is present without judging it. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so we can bring awareness to feelings in the present without judging it, without saying like, oh, I shouldn't be feeling like this, or I should be, or this is terrible, or right? Um, we can bring awareness to discomfort in our body. This is uncomfortable without judging the pain, without saying, oh, it's never going to be better. I hate this. I can't believe I stubbed my toe. What was I thinking, right? That's the judgment. Mm -hmm. And so mindfulness is coming back to just simply acknowledging what is present without judging. And we can do that, for example, with the, the activity I just shared where we look around the room and find a color or a shape that's pleasant or neutral to look at and then just focusing on that, right? So that's mm -hmm. a way to externally practice mindfulness without having to go into the breath or the body. Okay. And sometimes people can't really can't go into the body. Um, and so looking at something and just focusing on it. And I tell people, get curious about it. What do you see? Get curious about the color, the texture, the material that's made. So we're being mindful in that moment. We're practicing. And if your mind floats to a thought or a distraction or something else, that's fine. Just notice that and then bring it back to whatever you're looking at. So that's one way. Mm -hmm. um, I've also had kids um, draw still lifes, for example. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting is if they're drawing a still life, so drawing an object, a lot of times people will look at the object and then they'll look down and then they won't look back up again. <laughs> right and so then they're just working with whatever is in here and so it's prompting like check back get more information check back get more information uh -huh. um, through that process and another one that I really like um, that I've done with not so much with younger kids but with teens and adults is if we bridge a breath with something external and so taking a pencil and actually drawing your breath right mm -hmm. in whatever way makes sense for you so on the inhales and the exhales moving the pencil as if you're making a landscape of your breath and the feedback i get from people even long-term meditators is it helps them to drop into it a lot more um quickly uh than when they're just trying to focus on their breath because they're also doing something and the pencil and the movement of the hand is really making them have to concentrate hard uh -huh. on uh, bringing in that added component rather than just sitting with your thoughts and and your attention and that's all you have so adding that physical component to it can really help people to um, follow their breath and the changes in their breath as they go along those are fantastic very good yeah. tell us about your book and and how it would benefit parents sure so as you mentioned in the beginning it's called the innovative parent raising connected happy successful kids through art and i co-authored it as i mentioned before with ping ho who's the director and founder of ucla arts and healing mm -hmm. and what we did is we took a, a, a lot of um, personal experience myself as a mother and, and ping as a grandmother um, professional experience me as an art therapist and her um, doing like i said a lot of drumming and, and movement rhythm work with um, with youth therapeutic work with youth um, and um, and a whole lot of research and we pulled it all together into a really accessible uh, book for parents and, and also teachers and counselors have been finding it useful as well um, mm -hmm. so that they can understand one sort of the theoretical underpinnings of what we're talking about right why art why does this work and that's what we've been talking a lot about um, today um, but then also giving them um, very specific bullet points of activities that they can try for different situations and so there is a chapter on connecting there is a chapter on so building relationships right with us and our children or the children that you work with but also children with other children and then we have bullet points and what we did is next to each of the activities is we put C for child T for teen or P for parent or professional and so mm -hmm. it's sort of a quick reference for people to look if they don't want to read all the in-between stuff they can kind of quickly go to you know maybe they want to skip the chapter on connection and go to the chapter on emotions so we have one on connection one on emotional regulation one on um, academics actually and sort of cognitive ways to build the brain through different arts activities um, and then we also have a chapter called survive the day which is on troubleshooting behavioral problems in the moment and how to use creative arts in order to intervene okay great that sounds like a must-have for parents i think it is <laughs> I, I, I i think so too <laughs> um and where else can people find you um, so my website is www.therapywitherica.com and that's E-R-I-C-A, therapywitherica.com and I'm on Instagram at 
Erica K. Curtis, I think. We'll put um, the links below. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I'm not a big social media person, but after I had a book out, people were like, you need to be on social media. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm trying. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm definitely a, what they call them, a tech, technology um, immigrant transplant. <laughs> a tech not a native. No, okay. <laughs> not a native to technology. Um, and, um, oh, and I'd like to add to our book won the 2019 Parenting Products Award. So we were really excited about that. Congratulations. Um, thank you. And um, I'm in uh, South Orange County, but do workshops all over the country. I go up to LA a whole lot to do workshops up there. And, um, but the best way to get in touch with me is through my website. My phone number is on there and my email address. Okay, great. And is there anything else that we missed that's important for parents to know? Mm -hmm. I think that's enough. I think they have enough to metabolize for today. <laughs> I, I, think so. I think so too. <laughs> I was going to say yes, and I was like, well, no, that's enough, right? <laughs> Which is also a good practice as well. I can get overly enthusiastic, and but we need to take bites and metabolize and, and put something into practice. I guess that's it. You know, pick one thing out of this podcast today and put it into practice um, and, and experiment. I think okay. that would be my final word on that. Fantastic. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. It was really interesting. and I'm sure parents will find it very interesting. So thanks again. Thanks so much, Phil, for having me. Thank you for listening to the Learning Success Podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. We also hope you have learned something useful, something that you can take back and improve your life with today. If you would like to say thank you, the best way for you to do that is to share this podcast with a friend. Help us help others along this journey. And if you haven't already, please rate and comment on the podcast. Every rating helps us and helps this podcast get out to more people. We appreciate it and we appreciate you. Thank you again and make today a great day. No one should have to live with a learning difficulty.